Biobalance HealthCast, episode 228, Testosterone Production in Women. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the Biobalance HealthCast. I'm Brett Newcomb and this is Dr. Kathy Maupin. Dr. Maupin and I have written a book called The Secret Female Hormone and it was published a year ago March. And as a result of that book being published, Dr. Maupin was asked to come to the AAMG conference in Orlando, which is an international medical conference of physicians uh, and nurse practitioners. And she was asked to explain her point about testosterone being a female hormone and that women will benefit from and need replacement of lost testosterone in much the same way that men do. And she's, she's crying for gender parity, <laughs> uh, but she's trying to produce evidence and information for these physicians to sort of sort circuit their conditioned reflex about thinking of testosterone as a male hormone and not as a female hormone. Uh, we are, this is, this is the fourth in a series of podcasts, uh, evaluating and discussing her talk to this group of physicians because we're trying to to make it more available and more useful for the general public. What we hope is that you will use this information to educate yourself and to communicate with and educate your physician if they're not already educated so that you can consider together, you and your physician, can consider these elements in your own health care as you age. So whether they're appropriate for you, whether they're necessary for you, whether there's something you want to do or not. And also then as more of us become aware of it to nudge the FDA and the DEA and the politicians to change the laws uh, and the insurance companies so that this treatment is paid for uh, when it's applied to women in similar ways as it's paid for when it's applied to men. So we're going to continue our discussion by looking at uh, an argument that Dr. Maupin makes in her talk and in her book about ovaries producing testosterone for women uh, and, and how that functions and why it does it that way. Well, actually, in this, in this segment, mm-hmm. I'm opposing a, uh, a, a unrealistic view that testosterone is created in all these different places. Okay. Okay. Like testosterone is not, testosterone itself is not made in your adrenal gland. Testosterone's precursors, the chemicals that make testosterone, are go from the adrenal gland to the ovary. And then the ovary, you can view it as a factory. The ovary is a factory that then takes these pieces and then puts together testosterone and secretes it when we're young. It secretes it moderately throughout the cycle, but it spikes right before ovulation so that we get that sex drive we need to procreate. So it's not Igor saying that it comes from Abby, somebody normal? <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> Igor, it comes from, that comes from Igor's Abby normal. No, it comes, it, it is made, the, the precursors or the elements of testosterone, it's like a chemistry set, are made over here and then they come to the ovary and then they're put into the ovary to be then created into testosterone. Right. Why is this important? This is important because they're, Testosterone only comes from the ovary. The ovary shuts down. So the elements, gone. After, you, after you reach a certain age, the elements are still delivered to the delivery point, but the ovary isn't open for business anymore. That's right. So nothing happens to them. And all these people, all these folks who are selling you DHEA, if you're postmenopausal, they can't do anything. It can't do anything. DHEA right. does nothing because it makes testosterone in the ovary, and your ovary is out to lunch. So basically... But it's a DHEA waste, it's a wasted do, effort. It's yeah. waste and it's negative. DHEA will find another pathway. It will make estrone. Right. Estrone is a negative for us. It causes, it is one of the factors that stimulates breast cancer. It is one of the factors that causes us to be muddled and feel old and have like the, the you know, the 36 long breasts and, I mean, breast tenderness and belly fat. Yeah. I mean, estrone's bad. So why would you take DHEA? So, so DHEA basically says, if, if I can't make testosterone, then 
I'll make estrum. Most things in the human body right. have several pathways. Most elements that we produce to make one hormone can make other hormones. In fact, there's a very complicated um, uh, construction that occurs to make several hormones out of cholesterol. Wow. And that happens in the adrenal gland. And that happens, uh, that makes cortisol, it makes uh, androstenedione. dione, it makes, I mean, many of the other hormones that are created by the adrenal gland, but it doesn't make testosterone until it gets into the ovary. All right, well, let's look at the clip and see what you say to the physicians in Orlando. Ovaries make the majority of testosterone when we're in our fertile stage before we hit menopause. Actually, after menopause, no, we don't have much at all anyway. But testosterone has an effect on the adrenal. When testosterone drops, the adrenal makes more estrone. Estrone is the hormone of belly fat, breast tenderness, breast cancer. Estrone's the bad guy. It makes us all, both men and women, have the, the, the apple shape. And it really does decrease your memory. It, it affects how you think. So estrone then goes and makes, it actually stimulates belly fat. So belly fat then stimulates weight gain, which makes more estrone, because fat makes more estrone. So it's one of those very few positive feedback systems in the body that it just keeps positive, positive, positive. It's impossible to stop this process unless you block it or you give testosterone. If you give testosterone, then testosterone will start to process the other direction. It will decrease the production from the adrenal, or you could use a Remedex, which also decreases testosterone's conversion into estrone. Age of testosterone deficiency is 45. Average age for men is 55. Yet I'm starting to see younger and younger men in the office, which is really scary. They're 40, and they've got a testosterone of a 70-year-old. So what's doing that? I have no idea. They didn't have head injuries. I go through the whole thing. There's nothing that happened to them, and they're really low. They may not tell me about any anabolic steroids they used in the past, however, because they're afraid to tell about that. So they're not, they're not fertile in general, and they've do, they're done with childbearing, so, or child, <laughs> child making. So we're, so we're okay with giving them their testosterone back. One of the things I've got on my list to ask God when I get there is, <laughs> yeah. What? No. No. Why? Why did you have women's testosterone drop 10 years earlier than you have men's testosterone? Because in general, the average age for a woman to have the symptoms uh, and low testosterone levels is 45. Mm -hmm. The average age for men is 55. Why the discrepancy? It, I, I believe that it was to keep <laughs> women had to have the babies we died in childbirth right they we had to keep the population going so men could have several other wives after their wives died and still be able to propagate but that that's what i would that, say that opens an interesting can of worms yeah that does yeah but um and and it still happens today right <laughs> well the reality that you see is that it happens that that women start to display this symptomology and suffer this complaint earlier than men do. Mm -hmm. And not just because women are more aware of their bodies than men are, or more sensitive about things like that than men are. Those are both true statements mm -hmm. generally, but because it really changes the life quality of the women. And mm -hmm. you want to be able to restore that and rejuvenate that. And this next clip, we'll talk a little bit about why that's so important. Mm -hmm. So let's look at it. Age of testosterone deficiency is different, is different by 10 years. One of the reasons why there's so much trouble in marriages because men are fine, <laughs> and then their wives may be a few years younger, but they hit testosterone deficiency sooner, and they don't want to have sex anymore. And the men say, oh, you changed the deal. So that's one of the reasons I believe that we see all the uh, divorces in the 40s, when women are in their 40s, because that's when the deal changes. They don't want to have sex anymore, and their husbands go, wait a second, this isn't what I signed up for. If we did it at the same time, that we probably wouldn't notice. So one of the really interesting things about this clip that speaks to me because of my practice and experience of 30 years as a marriage counselor is the, the reference that women, because of the loss of testosterone, lose 
sexual desire. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of, for most of them, they experience it as a, as a gradual drift away. Mm -hmm. It's not something that, that, like you had your foot amputated, and so obviously you know it immediately and it's always bothering you. And Unless it, it you've just, had your ovaries out like I did and it and was there and then it it's gone. not there. Yes, so there are women for whom that is mm -hmm. reality. But so what happens then that connects it for me is in my business, Couples will come in and the man will complain because she never wants to have sex anymore or she doesn't want to have sex the way she used to have sex. It's much more accommodative, you know. Uh, oh, if you want to, okay. If yeah, we really I'll have to. And, and they're, yeah. you know, like, is that all you ever think about? You never leave me alone. You know, those kind of those kind of arguments yeah. that occur. And it's common. We used to think in my training that, you know, these were power plays that this was mm -hmm. some kind of a struggle for something within the relationship. And quite regularly, that disparity in desire or that change, you know, women get accused, you're interested in somebody else, you're not mm -hmm. interested in me, you're having an affair, or men say, well, if I can't get it here, I'll go get it somewhere else, and then they the go out. Uh, and, and it does change. And so then you have this huge upsurge in divorces between 40 and 60. Mm -hmm. It's not because the kids went to college. It's because of this. Right. I mean, it's every, not the empty nest syndrome. It's not the empty per nest se. yeah. syndrome. Because that's usually a time when, when you have sex drive. Great. We yeah. have the whole house to ourselves. Yeah. How'd you like the kitchen tonight? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, exactly. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's actually a good thing for people who have intact sexuality. Okay. So your argument then is if women and doctors know this and treat this component you put a lot of divorce lawyers out of, out of work. I hope so. Because the relationships don't They're way atrophy too busy. Uh, yeah, or become infected because right. of the loss of sex drive. Because oftentimes, if there if there was a different type of conflict in the relationship yeah. and this, that right. kind of... Makes everything adds, worse exponentially. Yeah, makes everything yeah. worse. But right. if that's the case, then they go out and they find the same problem and they have... I don't know if we've discussed this before, but they have a sex drive that is not based on testosterone because of a new relationship. Yeah. It lasts 18. Yes, that's an adrenaline surge. It's, it, it's, it's actually a different hormone. Yeah. It, it's a, a dopamine, norepinephrine, that gives you this that I'm in love kind of uh -huh. weird thing that uh, teenagers experience. And then oftentimes you see in people who have a new relationship experience and then after the 18 months is over and they've switched partners and they their whole world yeah. disrupted and their children are, and it's are like, I want to come home. Yeah. Then they realize that they've just made one choice for the other and they really don't want Same sex issues. anymore. Right. It's, it, so what it, about it, the guy? It was about the sex. Yeah. It wasn't about the guy wanting too much sex. It was about them not wanting sex. Well, they thought they were fixed when they had this new relationship, well, but it didn't really fix them it just gave them this little burst and then no more sex drive and there have been almost countless numbers of women who've paraded through your office <laughs> who've been to see other gynecologists who don't know what you know who lots were told, of others five six other gynecologists before they get who to were me. told that's just the way it happens you're getting old and you're supposed to lose your sex drive when you're so not trying when to have you're babies. 40 when you're 47 yeah your life is effectively over, over. you knew it yeah. yeah sex was just for procreation mm -hmm. see you later but men or Eureka, it must be a relationship problem. Yeah. You know, some yeah. dishonesties here somewhere. And you're depressed, have some more testo uh, yeah. testosterone su suppressing drug, which is yeah, antidepressant. So, uh, all of these things that we've talked about in these previous podcasts and this one too so far are about the importance of or the necessity of replacing testosterone before the positive, beneficial reasons mm -hmm. that come. So, a question that comes to mind for me is are there risks to taking mm -hmm. testosterone? Are there concerns that may offset or balance for some of us that consideration? So let's look at this clip where you talk to these physicians about the, the risks that you are aware of and, and what, what they really are. The risks are the biggest issues and the risks aren't big. Facial hair. Okay, you can have it taken off. You can use, you can use spironolactone. I'll go over the treatments or the prevention in a second. But thinning hair at the temples, that's a little bit more difficult to deal with. And uh, return of body hair, like on your arms, legs. If you had a belly, belly body hair and you're female, then you'll get it back. Basically, whatever you had when you were 30 comes back. And that's not always 
happy for most women because they thought they were done with it. But a lot of good things happen too. Temporary risks, clitoral enlargement, it comes and goes. Usually, I don't understand the big hubbub about that because no men ever have complained to me about their penis getting larger with testosterone. I just don't get it why everybody's excited about this. In medicine, obviously, if you're not taking anything and you have a large clitoris, it might mean that you had a tumor of the ovary, which I've never seen in all the years that I practiced gynecology. So I don't know why anybody's excited about that. It goes away after the body gets used to the treatment. And so I don't find that to be an issue um, for any of my patients. Now, a lower voice in singers is an issue. And anybody who's had a damage or radiation to their vocal cords, lowering their voice or making it less easy to hear if they've had, if they've had radiation or, or some other kind of surgery to their vocal cords might be a problem. And in that way, you either have to use finasteride to block the DHT, which is the active uh, ingredient that's causing that, or you have to lower the dose so that they don't, or, or in singers, you have to maybe not give them testosterone, just give them estradiol. It depends on what they agree to when they know the risk, because it is their choice. And then excessive libido in older patients, sometimes that's a huge problem. So women who don't have a partner or don't know how to use a toy or a vibrator, I have long talks with them, and that, I don't get very far. They're very uncomfortable with it. So oftentimes, I'll just lower the testosterone dose. Then they come back and say, well, hey, I don't feel as good as I did before. So I, I tell them they have to make the choice. So it's either you have to, you have to order something from drugstore.com in a little black, brown box that comes in the mail and put some batteries in it, or we ha you're not going to feel as good because there's a trade-off, and they have to be able to be the ones that make it. As you can have heard, the uh, risks are very, very small mm -hmm. compared to the benefits of testosterone. Even if we talk about getting your sex life back and saving your marriage, that one benefit well outweighs getting facial hair, which we can fix or prevent, getting acne, which we can prevent, and well, you receding think hairline. Would. You would think that it Just would, that, one that thing. makes sense to you logically, but a lot of the women that I have talked to, you know, they can see hair growth on their chin or hair so, loss on their head. So have they can't waxed. necessarily see that their sex life is better. You know, the absence of that stress is very real and, and improves the positive quality of their life. But they get in front of that mirror and they're like, oh my God, what's going on here? But the trouble is, most of those women had hair on their face when they were younger. <laughs> and, and they've forgotten. And they've forgotten. Yeah. And usually it brings you back to where you used to be. Okay. And Good point. the adrenal gland causes you to have hair, those hairs that yeah. come out of your chin, without any testosterone added. Like People grandma come in, whiskers. Yeah, come in and say, I have grandma whiskers. And I said, well, those will go away and other whiskers or other other um, hair will come up mm -hmm. because basically we'll shut down the adrenal that's making all, all of these, not the adrenal gland totally, but we'll shut down the production of that hormone of DHT and we will give you back your testosterone so you'll get the hair you had when you were 30. So if their bodies have been depleted for a significant time and you give them back their testosterone, there's like a pop in their sex drive. Right. And sometimes there's a clitoral enlargement as you spoke right. to. It's a temporary issue. For a little bit, a month or less. Yeah, a usually. month or less. And I can't make that happen again. <laughs> But even I, for those even who want for it. those who want it, yeah. but for those who don't want it or find it time consuming to have a sex drive all the time, I, I <laughs> say so tired. I say that this is something that you should think about all those poor boys that you dated yeah. when you were eighteen or seventeen, and that's how they felt. Yeah. So at least gives us a, a view well, into someone else because because you know. Thank you for speaking had to, for the lesser half. I had I had to think about that when that happened to me. I hadn't had I had had a significant drop in my testosterone when my ovaries were out, but I'd had a long-term drop uh, before that. So that long-term drop left me with receptor sites that were open and waiting for testosterone. So so it's a, a temporary thing. It goes away. One of those, that's something that I think is tolerable. It isn't terribly expensive to get waxed. Yeah. I mean, it isn't terribly 
painful if the right people are doing it. Right. Women get their nails done. Wax and they can or go there laser, and get or there's drugs, as you mentioned, finasteride yeah. that helps with hair issues. Or so, spironolactone so is easy and not as as uh, costly or as. Uh, I, finasteride's a little tricky, but usually now we're starting to use finasteride topically. Topically. So that so that actually takes away any of the finasteride issues. So in closing, let us remind you that this these conversations are intended to be educational. What we're hoping is that you will read our book, of course, or the information that's on the website or that you hear in these podcasts, and that you will think about it and you will discuss it with your physician and you and your physician will decide whether or not this is a treatment that you should consider and you should try to improve the quality of your life as you age. That's always our goal when we do these podcasts. Thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the BioBalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.